So, you know, my journey started in fellowship. Um, I was with Tom Norris back in 06. I finished with him in 07. And, you know, at the time, reverse shoulder was only available in the U.S. for about three years. And so it was really in its infancy, and we were just learning a lot about it um, at the time. You know, as Rob mentioned, Grammont style reverse, medialized center of rotation, 155 degree neck shaft angle. And that's what we had available to us. You can imagine my surprise being a fellow seeing this kind of modification for the reverse. And, you know, we all know BioRSA kind of initially had its origin primarily as a means to prevent scapular notching. Um, you know, now we might look at some biomechanical benefits of it, but again, that was where it started. So that was my first, first experience with modifying or trying to modify the mechanics. So I was in private practice in Hawaii. Um, you know, I started off using the Grammont, just like a lot of us. We leave fellowship, we used what we trained with. Um, but, you know, honestly, there wasn't a whole lot available in terms of variations of design back then. But then as I continued in my years of practice, uh, you know, we started to see this shift of people changing neck shaft angles, kind of more towards that 140, 145 range, and then a mix of inlay and onlay, which Rob touched on. And then again, as my practice kept evolving, we started seeing people dabbling with changing the center of rotation. And even though we're talking about lateralized center of rotations, we always, we always have to remember it's relatively lateralized, right? It's, it's still not lateralized compared to an anatomic center of rotation. And even despite all these changes, we still saw good outcomes. Even myself, you know, if you honestly ask me to quantify or qualify the difference in my patients back then that where I started and where I was in my mid-career, I really couldn't tell much of a difference. And I put this up just to kind of show what I would say are my mid-career cases. You know, you have starting on the left there, a 142 degree inlay design with a little bit more medialized center of rotation. The center picture is a 145 degree onlay with a slightly lateralized center of rotation. And then that last picture is kind of a mix of both. It's a lateralized center of rotation with a little bit of a variability in the neck shaft angle. You could go as low as 135, as high as 145. Probably this one was where I usually stayed right at the 140 level. So, you know, I had this talk with Mark Frankel. It was at the Las Vegas shoulder meeting here about three, four years ago. And, you know, he wanted me to do a lab with him. He wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one lab with him. So I said, okay, that's great. I get to work with him. He was really talking to me about this anatomic reverse. Uh, lateralized center of rotation, even setting the center of rotation high towards the center of the glenoid face, and then the lateralized humerus, or the lateralized and inset humerus. And you know, his points were talking about proper tensioning of the rotator cuff by this more lateralized design, and restoring a more anatomic center of rotation. And you know, you see that bottom statement there, you know, this didn't really make sense to me because, you know, in my mind, the reverse shoulder replacement is not an anatomic shoulder replacement. I left that lab kind of dismissing a lot of what Frankel told me just because I just, it didn't fit with the paradigm I had at the time. So then I, we heard somebody use this phrase, this aha moment, and I'll kind of describe my, my personal aha moment. So as it was talked about early on, I give lectures to the UNLV residents, and I was giving a resident talk about shoulder uh, biomechanics or shoulder mechanics, and then also a lecture on shoulder arthroplasty. And during the talk, I was giving a, you know, I gave um, a discussion about the importance of soft tissue balancing in an anatomic shoulder, not only for function, but for survivability of your subscapularis repair. And a little bit after I gave that talk, I think I was just thinking about it. And then it dawned on me at that point that maybe Frankel is right. I was kind of thinking about that biomechanics talk again. And some of this came about with discussion with my hip and knee colleagues or hearing some of their lectures. You know, all arthroplasty surgery, whether we're talking shoulder, knee, hip, or whatnot, it's a bone surgery. We're replacing bone surfaces with metal and plastic. But really, the ultimate goal is to restore the soft tissue function, soft tissue tension. There's very few, I, I can't think of any arthroplasty that ignores that principle. So then I said, well, a native shoulder or a, a normal anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty you know, the biomechanics are that force couple, right? The, the cuff is trying to maintain the, the center of rotation, the humeral head centered in the glenoid vault, or, or positioned relative to the glenoid vault, and it's, it remains relatively fixed while the deltoid and the residual cuff or remaining cuff move that center of rotation. Well, what are we doing in a reverse shoulder replacement? This, the glenosphere is that fixed center of rotation, and the remaining deltoid and cuff move the humerus around that fixed center of rotation. So the two concepts are very similar. And I know I'm simplifying biomechanics, but I'm a simple guy. 
So that's how I kind of think about it. So you know that plays back to why I was saying Frankel was right, because then the thought started to meld to me that maybe an anatomic reverse shoulder replacement isn't such a crazy idea. And so then I started hearing about the deltoid wrap. You know, the deltoid wrap is facilitated by that more lateralized design of the humerus. And the concept is the deltoid wraps around the greater tuberosity. It's not as lengthened as you would see in a Grammont. And it applies a more compressive and to some degree a rotational moment to the humerus. So I kind of liked the idea. I said, well, that's a little bit more of a normal deltoid contour. And if it's a more normal deltoid contour, like Rob said, if it's a more normal shape, maybe it functions more normally. So that, that concept kind of appealed to me. I also thought if the deltoid's not stretched, if it's not being over lengthened, perhaps that might help out with this concept that we know happens with reverse shoulder replacements at six years or so, where the deltoid starts to fatigue. And we also know, that at least from the uh, exact tech guys, that maybe that deltoid wrap helps with stability. So then uh, the other things I was thinking about or saw that on a more anatomic center of rotation and a more anatomic humerus helps tension the residual rotator cuffs. You, we saw that some, from some papers from Chris Roche. And then lastly, I started seeing the rising use of reverse shoulder in intact cuff cases. And in, in fact, there's a lot of publications coming out regarding that. And so if that's maybe where reverse shoulder is heading, why not try to maximize the residual cuff function by changing things to a more anatomic position? There's some literature support here. I think Rob wrote, uh, went over some of the similar ones, but it's basically the same, a repetition of the same concepts. I wanted to get to these diagrams, because these diagrams are really kind of what started pushing me into this direction of lateralized, lateralized. So you see on the far left represents the cuff tension in an anatomic shoulder, in a native shoulder. The next picture over is a medialized center of rotation with a medialized humerus. This picture here, third from the right, is a, I'm sorry, third from the left, is a lateralized center of rotation with maybe a slightly lateralized humerus. In that case, maybe not so much. But this last picture is a lateralized center of rotation with a lateralized humerus. And if you look at this representation, the cuff tensions better and better as you get further lateral with that global lateralization. Again, trying to get more towards matching that normal anatomy. That picture up here on the uh, top left, the anatomic center of rotation, the deltoid moment arm, something just kind of representing what the deltoid wrap would look like in an anat or a normal native shoulder. The Grammont shoulder, medialized center of rotation, much larger deltoid moment arm, a very flat deltoid, whoops, flat deltoid with minimal contour, but you see where the humerus is just not in an anatomic position. This more exact tech design shoulder with a medialized center of rotation, a lateralized but distalized humerus, has a fairly large moment arm, has the deltoid wrap, but the deltoid is lengthened just because of the humerus being distalized. I liked this picture here on the bottom left. Why? Because of the three pictures with a reverse shoulder, which one approximates this native shoulder the most? It's this one, with a lateralized center of rotation and an inset and lateralized humerus. You still get the benefit of the deltoid wrap. You're not as distalized overall with the humerus. And if you look at that Gothic arc, Shenton's line, or whatever you want to call it, it's the most normal of the three, of the three examples. So again, thinking that anatomic reverse shoulder replacement, it starts to make more sense to me when I see pictures like this. So how does that translate to the shoulder innovations in set reverse? Well, it's 135, or sorry, 132.5 degree neck shaft angle. So it's a more varus neck cut. So it actually pushes the humerus out a little bit more lateral. Um, you have a lateral or options for lateralized center of rotation. And you can set that center of rotation up higher on the glenoid if you want to achieve this more anatomic center of rotation. The inset humerus with a lateralized, um, the inset humerus overall plus the varus neck cut lateralizes the humerus and in general avoids distalization and in my mind over tensioning the deltoid. And the less distalized center of rotation, in other words, setting a little bit higher on the glenoid face avoids over lengthening as well. So I'm gonna show you some things. Remember I showed you my three mid-career cases. Those are the three x-rays on the top. And then the three bottom x-rays are some of my early SI cases. So what I want you to pay attention to, because it's the easiest thing for me to see without drawing a whole bunch of angles, 
if I look at that Gothic arch, the humerus, medial edge of the humerus is way down here, it's way down here, and it's way down here, all relative to that lateral scapular border. But when you look at my SI cases, I can almost easily draw an arc on all of these. So to me, that's restoring that anatomy, probably as accurately as I can with a reverse shoulder replacement. So just like Rob, I'm gonna show you one of my first cases. 80-year-old female, severe OA and a compromised rotator cuff. You can see her humeral head is very flattened out of round and her pre-op function fairly poor. And we kind of talked about this already. You know, what did I have to get used to with that first case is the reduction in dislocation field was very loose. To achieve an anatomic reverse, you really can't put in thicker trays or thicker polys, because again, you start to distalize the humerus, not just lateralize it, not just gain tension. You actually affect where the humerus lies. You have to use a smaller sphere, because as you get bigger spheres, the humerus just rides up too high and looks like it's gonna impact the acromion. So you have to use a fairly small sphere so that that doesn't happen. You just feel like it's n not the same as when you've put in onlay reverse shoulder designs or Grammont shoulder designs. It's a, it's a much different feel. So why am I a believer? Because this is my first case. Not that one case makes all the difference in the world, but it, it sure is impressive. She's two months out, she has had no physical therapy. This is all done by herself. And again, just like Rob's case, probably the thing that impressed me the most is that. Can you make the humerus too lateral? Um, because one concern is as you get further out lateral and you go into abduction, the greater tuberosity looks like it's gonna impact or hit the acromion. I felt this myself in surgery and I've worried about it, but I've even gone so far as trying to do a little bit of a tuberoplasty just to see if I might minimize that. You can't take off enough tuberosity to really feel like you're making a difference really in surgery. But what do I see of the patients clinically? The patients feel fine. I've never had a patient say, well, I feel it hit or I feel it grind. So I was trying to figure out why. And really the answer actually, I think Peter sort of alluded to this when he started talking about therapy and scapulothoracic motion. Scapulohumeral rhythm matters in the reverse, right? The first 30 degrees of glenohumeral motion, you're not really changing much with the scapular position. But past that, the scapular humor rhythm really kicks in with that two to one ratio. Now there's some papers that say that that two to one ratio in reverse shoulder replacement doesn't hold, it's actually less than two to one ratio. But the scapula, none, nevertheless, the scapula is moving. The humerus is not moving by itself. When we look at 3D planning softwares that model impingement, they're modeling impingement based off of a static scapula. The scapula never moves. But that doesn't happen for real. Right, so look at how early the scapula moves and the tuberosity really never hits. Or if it looks like it hits, I'll do two things here. This is pure abduction. You might say, well, that's hitting. But now I go into external rotation. Look at how soon the scapula moves anyway. There's no way that that externally rotated humerus, that that tuberosity is hitting the acromion because it can't, but the scapula still moves. So in my mind, this concern that getting too lateral is gonna cause impingement against the acromion, I don't think it actually happens. I can't prove it other than this weak C-arm study, but I have a strong suspicion that because I can't see it clinically, it's probably not, I hope it's not real. So is my opinion right and absolute? Obviously the answer is no. I was at the Shoulder 360 meeting, Howard Rotman was saying, you know, there are so many variables at play, you can see all of them here, that changing a few of them, changing one of them, we really don't know that, that, how that interacts with all these myriad of variables. So again, I say I'm doing this thing because I have certain beliefs, I'm making assumptions, I hope it plays out that my patients do well, but you know, every change has a benefit and a cost, and uh, hopefully I'm choosing the right things. Um, this, is my, this is where I'm at now. It's an evolving journey. What I might tell you guys in a year would be different, but you know, I've decided to go kind of all in on this thought, and I'm holding with it, and hopefully my patients see the clinical benefits.